Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for today's NAC at Home program. My name is Nadine Heidinger and I'm the Director of Communications at the National Arts Club. For those of you who are not familiar with the National Arts Club, we are a 501c3 nonprofit based in New York City with a mission to stimulate, foster, and promote public interest in the arts. Annually, we host over 150 free programs, including exhibitions, uh, musical performances, lectures, and readings. For more information about the National Arts Club, you can visit us at nationalartsclub.org, or you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Today, we're joined by Phil Keith and Tom Clavin, who will be discussing their acclaimed biography, All Blood Runs Red, which recounts the previously untold story of history's first African-American wartime pilot, Eugene Bullard. Today's discussion will once again be led by skilled moderator and host of the Brooklyn-based Paige Turner's reading series, Glenn Roucher. Following the discussion will be a brief Q&A, so please feel free to use the Q&A function to post any questions you might have. Yet without further ado, here is Glenn. Please enjoy the program. Thank you very much, Nadine, and thank you all who are watching with us. We really appreciate you being here. Um, it's the, the quarantine, the pandemic, the lockdown still somewhat, and even with that, we know there's 10,000 different things that you could be doing on this Thursday night, and none of us involved in this event take it for granted that you've chosen to be here with us. So thank you very, very much for that. My name is Glenn Rauscher. I am, as Nadine said, currently the host of the Page Turner's Reading Series, formerly the Half King Reading Series held at the Beloved Bar on the west side of New York. Um, your reward for being with us this evening uh, against all those other things you could be doing is to have an evening with the authors of All Blood Runs Red, Phil Keith and Tom Clavin. As Nadine also mentioned, uh, we are going to have a conversation. You're going to hear some of the book from Phil and Tom, uh, but we also want your questions about the book as they say things that stimulate questions. Please put your questions in the Q&A at the bottom of the Zoom screen, not the chat, but the Q&A. And do please shape your thoughts in the form of a question. Uh, it's easy to do here, so the shorter questions are better. I will not, of course, be able to get to all of them, but I will get to as many as I possibly can. You can chat about the event in the chat function. That's perfectly fine as well. Um, I heartily encourage you to buy at least one copy of this fine, fine book, and it's available through Books on Call NYC's bookshop.org page. That'll be placed in the chat of this event. Just click on it and you'll be able to purchase the book. Um, all formats are available, and thank you for supporting hardworking authors and independent booksellers with your purchase. And remember, the New York City law is a two-book minimum. Uh, you'll also be able to get signed book plates after the event. After you've made your purchase, Books on Call will reach out with information on getting your signed book plate at no extra charge. Just note that the book and book plates will come separately. And now I'd like to introduce our featured authors. Phil Keith and Tom Clavin's All Blood Runs Red is a story about which it can be said, it seems too good to be true. An American, Eugene Bullard, born in deepest Jim Crow South, who somehow through his own efforts and as Phil and Tom relate so well, some uncanny luck that he's savvy enough to capitalize on, lived a profoundly rich, unusual and eventful life. Runaway, expat, boxer, veteran of the French army in both world wars, seeing some of the greatest horrors humanity has ever inflicted on each other in both of them, musician and club and gym owner, spy, humble employee of Rockefeller Center. It's fair to say that Eugene Bullard lived many lives in his single one. It's not completely possible to know what the many well-known figures Phil and Tom weave accurately into Bullard's story made of this singular figure. One of the great challenges that the authors meet head on is the lack of verifiable information about Bullard's life, not the least of which was his own telling of it. But what Phil and Tom do with painstaking research, separating as they are able, fact from fable, is to make it clear that what this life was was indeed remarkable, rare, and so too the man that lived it. The authors lead you expertly through this marvelous life, so by the end of All Blood Runs Red, you're able to think of Eugene Bullard 
as standing among the renowned figures of the 20th century who figure in his story, and he is so presented in this terrific book. Please join me in welcoming Phil Keith and Tom Clavin. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you for being here. Really appreciate it. It's a pleasure. Um, tell me about the genesis of the book, how you came upon the story, and what compelled you first to think of it as a worthy subject for your book, and then how you work together bringing the book about. Well, I'll start with that one. Actually, there are two parts to this. Uh, Tom has his own unique little story about how he sort of got tied into this project. But I was doing some research on another book that I was writing on uh, World War I, and I was putting together a chapter on famous American aviators who participated in the war. And of course, we know the uh, United States didn't get into it until quite late in 1917. But <clears throat> um, there were a number of Americans who had decided to participate in the war before America got in. And a number of them went to France and uh, especially those who were trained already as, as pilots or aviators of some sort, um, uh, signed up with various services like the French, some with the British, and they were already at war. Well, then when America got over there, America issued a call for these people, uh, all the Americans who were then flying for other countries to, you know, come to Paris, uh, take a medical exam, and if you're qualified, uh, you can uh, transfer immediately to the American Air Service. Well, uh, Gene Ballard, and we'll find out shortly how he started flying, but uh, he was among those uh, already flying for France, certainly an American by birth, and he went immediately with a bunch of his buddies on the train to Paris and uh, took the physical exam, um, signed up, and uh, was immediately not accepted. And there was a, I was doing some research on Eddie Rickenbacker, and, and everybody knows Eddie Rickenbacker, but there was a footnote at the bottom of the page in this particular uh, chapter of the book I was uh, looking into, and it said, all these flyers were accepted for service except one, Gene Ballard, the first African-American fighter pilot in history. And I said, wait a minute, who is this? I've never heard of this guy. Well, um, that, of course, piqued my, my curiosity. And uh, what's the first thing a good researcher does these days? You run to Wikipedia. And uh, certainly, there he was. He had a Wikipedia page, so I knew he was uh, it was a real thing. But uh, there was much, much, much more to his story. When I started to research it, I said, "Wow, this is this is this is a great book." And that's how I, I got started uh, in the Gene Ballard story. Tom came at it just slightly differently, but we've been friends for a long time, and we started talking about it. And I'll let him take it from here. Well, I, we have a mutual friend named Joe Shaw, who's a newspaper editor, and Joe had somehow saw a mention of, of Eugene Bullitt and, and, and had sent me an email uh, thinking that I might be interested in doing this story. And uh, I think it was very shortly after that, that Phil and I were having a conversation and it just came up and it's like, well, oh, really, Phil said, I've been looking into this guy and I'm finding out that he's much more intri intriguing than, than I first thought. So um, I guess my next step was to, you know, ha how could I find a co-author who would do all the work yet share the credit with me? Uh, <laughs> that's so. It doesn't, apply to, that? it doesn't apply to the royalty checks, though. Right. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> so, fair is fair. Bill and I started talking, and as we, as we ta started talking about Gene's life, we got more excited about it. And I think part of that excitement was starting to peel, find out more and peel these layers away. And there were so many layers. This wasn't a one note life. And uh, we, we were fortunate that we were able to uh, put a proposal together and, and find a publisher, uh, in this case, Hanover Square Press, which is a division of HarperCollins, to, uh, to say, yes, we're excited about this too, go for it. And so that's how the collaboration began. So uh, go ahead, Phil, you wanted to say? Well, you, you also asked, you know, how it was uh, working together. Um, it, 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 this is the first time I've, you know, co-authored uh, with someone. I'm certainly more than happy to do it with my friend Tom. 
but we were both wondering, you know, how this would work out. And, and it, it turned out that uh, the book in his life, Ballard's life, spoke to both of our strengths. Um, with my military background, it made me, it, it made it easy for me to to do a lot of the military research and uh, writing. Uh, Tom knew more than I had ever picked up about, you know, jazz and you know, jazz and in in the jazz age in Paris and uh, sports and boxing. So it was kind of a natural uh, mix that uh, we both wrote to using our individual strengths. You'd mentioned uh, when you talked about the genesis of the book. Um, I, I do want to give people a taste of the writing of the book. You mentioned how Bullard became a pilot, and then we can, of course, revisit how he got to France in the first place. Um, there's a wonderful image from the book. I think we have a, a slide of it here. And I would, I would love, Phil, if you could read us a brief segment about Eugene Bullard, the pilot. Well, he, uh, of course, became very conscious of his place in history because, quite frankly, there weren't many African-American aviators at all during this period of time. So I wanted to read just this little bit about how he approached this significant milestone in his life and, in fact, uh, this milestone in history. So this, this comes from uh, September 8th of 1917, which was his very first combat mission. And I'll read from the book. <clears throat> this is me, and then I'm gonna switch to, to Gene. Anyone on their first aerial combat mission is decidedly nervous, excited, and terrified. Eugene Ballard was all three. In addition, he clearly understood his place in the annals of aviation. He knew without question that he was about to become the first African-American fighter pilot in history. He would later recall about that groundbreaking mission. These are his words. In three minutes or less, the order was given, parte, meaning go. The chocks were pulled away, and so we did and fast. I sincerely believe that there has never been a pilot aviator who did not have a funny feeling on his first combat patrol and who wasn't really scared the first time that he faced the enemy in the air or who was flying in formation to meet the enemy. I am not ashamed to admit these facts about myself. Why should I be? I'm not an angel, nor am I a hero. Anyhow, I was determined to do all that was in my power to make good as I knew that the eyes of the world, sorry about that, <clears throat> were watching me as the first Negro military pilot in the world. I felt the same way Lindbergh felt when he was the first to fly from New York to Paris. I had to do or die, and I didn't want to die. Thank you for that. Um, we're obviously talking about him fighting in, in World War I and fighting for France. Um, how does a uh, black man born in the heart of Jim Crow South um, come to, I think it's safe to say, become obsessed with Paris, obsessed with France, and how does he actually wind up getting there? Well, in, in the case of, of uh, Gene, he was born in Georgia to a family. His father had actually been born into slavery. He was born during the Civil War. And he was uh, the seventh of 10 children. And uh, it was very, very difficult because of the racism there. But, and also his father had to support 10 children working basically a, a laborer job. Uh, his mother was a, a, a Creek uh, Indian. And uh, um, his father would say, I mean, Gene, like his siblings, was petrified many times, worried about their safety and, and their lives, really. Uh, there was even one incident where armed men came to the house looking for his father, who had been in a fight with a white overseer. So, <clears throat> but his father would say to Gene, he probably said it to all, to all his children, but it was Gene who really took it to heart that, you know, someday maybe you'll get to France because in France, uh, people are treated the same. It doesn't matter the color of their skin. 
perhaps a little bit idealized, but a lot of, there's a lot of truth to that. And, and Jean, as a child, really took that as gospel truth. And as he got older, and by older, I only mean eight, nine, 10, 11 years old, it became more a part of his um, personality that he was gonna find a way to get to France. And he actually ran away a few times when he was 11 and 12 years old with the idea that he had no idea where France was or how to get to it. He knew he had to start somewhere, so that was start by running away. His father found him the first few times and, and, and brought him back, but eventually Gene ran away and his father didn't find him. And he uh, really for several years lived by, in some ways, the kindness of strangers who would take him in, give him jobs, give him food. He worked his way up and down around the south, the, the south. and uh, uh, it was when he was, I think, 15 that uh, he managed to find, he found himself, he eventually got to a, a seaport, I believe it was Newport News, uh, Virginia, and uh, he, saw, he, he saw some, he heard some sailors coming off a ship, a big ship, and uh, speaking a foreign language. Now, he assumed the only foreign language that existed was French. <laughs> And so he said, oh, great, this must be a ship that's heading to France. I'll stow away, and this is how I get to France, which he did. He stowed away about three days out. Uh, he was discovered, or he actually revealed himself because he was starving and, and, and other discomforts. And um, uh, it was actually a German ship that the law of the sea at that time required them to drop a stowaway off at the very first port of call, which turned out to be Aberdeen, Scotland. So here you have this, this 15, 16 year old uh, black youth from rural Georgia uh, who knew very, very little or next to nothing about the whole wide world suddenly deposited in Aberdeen, Scotland. The good news about that is he at least made it to Europe. The next goal was to make it to Paris. And, and when, he was in, when he was in Aberdeen, um, what, what, what did he find there? What, how different was the world that, was it 17-year-old Bullard finds when he first gets to the UK? How different was the world to him and how did he respond to it? Well, at least, <clears throat> at least the, spoke, the people spoke a form of English. He, right. he wasn't quite sure because the Scottish brogue is uh, quite different than uh, rural Southern English. <clears throat> but he managed to make uh, uh, heads and tails of, uh, of the language. And he discovered that he had not quite landed where he really needed to be. So he decided to keep working his way toward France, wherever that might be. And of course, uh, he arrived uh, penniless. The, the, the German crew aboard the ship uh, had taken pity on him and they took up a little collection and actually paid him for the work he did on the ship. So he had a few dollars in his pocket, but that wasn't going to last long. So he took various odd jobs, one of which was acting as a uh, kind of an advanced man for a group of uh, characters who were doing, you know, sidewalk games, trying to cheat the public. And Gene was the lookout for the police. So when the police turned the corner, you know, he would run and tell the guys they were on the way. <clears throat> then he took a job as a longshoreman and he was loading sides of lamb and beef aboard uh, ships, uh, you know, very hard, backbreaking work. But then he took a job um, at a carnival. He convinced uh, the carnival owner who had a game, and the game was uh, someone would stick their head through uh, a sheet uh, that was positioned uh, probably 20 or so feet away from a, a line of folks who could take soft rubber balls and, you know, try to hit the head that was poking through the sheet, and if you hit the head three times, you won a prize. Well, <clears throat> he convinced the carnival owner that it would be much more interesting if a black head popped through the sheet. Um, and, and really, uh, people in Scotland at that time had rarely, if ever, seen a black person. He was uh, kind of a, a unique individual. Well, eventually, he collected you know, a bit of money, enough to jump aboard a train and his next stop was in uh, Liverpool, England, where his life began to take shape and really took a very interesting turn. And I'll let Tom uh, talk about that for a bit. Well, 
he, uh, he, he went into a gym and saw people sparring and boxing. And he was fascinated by this, it intrigued him. And he managed to convince the gym manager or owner to give him a, a job, whatever it was. He eventually convinced the gym owner to let him take boxing lessons, to let him spar with the other boxers. And he had a talent for it. He was, he was a naturally gifted uh, athlete. He was not a big man. He was kind of more of a short in stature, but, but a very good athlete. And it was boxing that got him to Paris, finally to realize his dream, because he was training with boxers. He was, one of the people that taught him, that helped train him, was Jack Johnson, who had been the heavyweight champion of the world. People know that, that character from the great play and movie, The Great White Hope. And uh, uh, eventually, uh, the, the manager of this troupe of boxers got them uh, fights. Uh, Gene won his bouts and eventually got him fights in France and, 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 and Paris. And uh, so Gene arrived in Paris finally as a boxer who eventually became a welterweight contender. And if the war had not intervened, uh, there's certainly the possibility that one turn that Gene Ballard's life would have taken was probably uh, maybe contending for a welterweight championship, even perhaps returning to the United States to fight in the United States as a welterweight contender. His timing was impeccable. He arrives in France in April of 1914. And in August, you know, the war breaks out. The, 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 something that, that you, you, got, you both communicate so well about him is, and, I, and I, I, want, I want this word can be pejorative, but I don't mean it in the pejorative sense. It seems over and over he was utterly unafraid to put himself forward as a solution to somebody else's problem, that, that he was in the best sense of the word, a hustler. Not in the sense of getting over on anyone, but but he was incredibly adaptable and completely unafraid of trying something new to him. What, what, what was the source of that incredible skill and aptitude? I think if you could bottle it, you'd be a billionaire. Sure. Something very special about Gene Bullard in that he had great reservoirs of resiliency. Uh, he had a rather engaging personality. Uh, people took to him. They saw something in him that was, he was kind of a unicorn in some, some, some ways. And, uh, and he was lucky. You know, his father had always said, because he was the seventh child, that the seventh child was going to be the lucky child. And uh, that certainly turned out to be true because some of what eventually enabled him to make his way through life, including surviving two world wars, was luck. And he had a facility for languages, he, even on the... Uh ship on the way over, uh, stowing away, he picked up quite a bit of German and was able to become almost fluent in German. And then as soon as he got to France, he began to immediately adapt to his new environment. He learned French very quickly. So as Tom said, he was extraordinarily lucky. Uh, Glenn, as you said, he was incredibly adaptable. And when you combine that with a pretty good brain, uh, he, uh, he actually did quite well. After he arrives in Paris, you mentioned very quickly after he arrives, uh, larger events intervene to whatever his plans to be a champion boxer or whatever plans he had. How, how, what does he do on his 19th birthday? <laughs> well, he joins the French Foreign Legion, of all things. Um, he immediately fell in love with Paris. He absolutely fell in love with France, the French people, and he became... Uh, quite inured to the whole society very quickly. And when the war broke out, he said, this is my new adopted country. Um, I want to do my part. I want to fight for France. And you couldn't join until you turned 19. But on his 19th birthday, he walked down to the recruiting office in the only French military organization a foreigner could join at that time was the famous French Foreign Legion. So he joins the 3rd Marching Regiment. And uh, this is in August. And uh, to tell you how critical manpower supplies were and how quickly the war was accelerating, he was actually in the trenches by November. What was his battle experience like in World War I? Well, as Phil mentioned, he was in the trenches. And we most people are aware that uh, there were few see more s scenes of carnage than what happened in the trench warfare of World War I, where in a single battle you had 
not a, a couple of thousand casualties, you could have tens of thousands of casualties. You know, the Sum, the Argonne, the Forest, the Bella Wood, uh, all these places were, were uh, meat grinders, uh, you know, chewing up tens of thousands of lives. And uh, Gene was right in the middle of that. Uh, he, he was a private, he was a machine gun, the head of a machine gun unit, uh, eventually became a corporal. Uh, all around him during these, he was he was with the others going up over the you know charge. Let's let's get out of this trench and go up over. And 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 all around him, people were dying. They were dying from bullet wounds. They were dying from sh artillery shells landing on them. Uh, dying from hand to hand combat. Um, it it's it, he he ended up at uh, at Verdun, which is one of the I think battles that that defined the 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 horror of World War One. And it was in that battle that he was quite severely wounded. I mean, wounded that he finally, there were times when he got wounded before, but he did not leave, voluntarily leave the front lines. Um, and finally he was wounded so seriously that he, he had to be brought back and, and faced months and months and months of convalescence. And you, you're probably gonna ask this question and, and I guess Phil will field it, but okay, he came back to Paris as a wounded veteran, war over, right? Well, not for, not for Jean Ballard. So he, he uh, obviously made of some sterner stuff than most people. He is, he's terribly wounded. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, don't, I want people to come across the description of that as I did and have to put the book down for a minute and then, of course, pick it back up to find out what happens. But he's wounded and no one would blame him for sitting out the rest of the war. Instead, he becomes, decides to become a fighter pilot. Um, you read some there. He becomes the first that we know African American fighter pilot in 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 war at all. Is that what you what you've discovered? First American to become a fighter pilot in history. Absolutely, we did a lot of research to make sure that we were firm uh, on that particular point. But uh, uh, as Tom said, when he was convalescing, he uh, was actually given a certificate by the doctors. Uh, uh, that would attest to the fact that he was so seriously wounded that he was exempt from further service. But that's not how he felt about it. The war was still going on and he was still able to, in his mind, shoulder a weapon and he did not want to sit out the remainder of the war. And <clears throat> during his convalescence, which was about six months uh, in hospital, uh, he, he ran across another fellow who happened to be a, a pilot who had also been wounded and was convalescing. And uh, the pilot uh, said to him, well, look, when, you, when you're all better and when you can move around and get off that crutch that you're on, uh, come see me. Because uh, if the infantry doesn't want you, uh, you know, we, we still need uh, brave people in the air and you're a machine gunner. I mean, you, you can sit in the back of the plane and fire a machine gun which is actually how he started. He, he started in um, aviation machine gun school. And uh, as soon as he got there, he decided, well, why not go for the, go for the gold? I mean, I want to sit in the front, not in the back. <laughs> and uh, he talked- There's he, a metaphor in there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> he, he talked the local training commandant into giving him a shot at it. And he turned out to be, to be pretty good. Uh, but there, there are two other uh, aspects of this that are kind of fun. I'll tell one, I'll let Tom tell the other. Uh, these guys, you know, during training, they had a lot of time on their hands uh, during bad weather because, you, you know, those are the kinds of planes you can't simply fly in bad weather. <clears throat> so they spent a lot of their bad weather time uh, in Paris, mostly in the bars. And uh, Gene came back from an overnight in Paris uh, one time in uh, mid-1917, and he woke up and there was a capuchin monkey sitting on the end of his bed staring at him. And he goes, oh my God, where did this come from? And then he suddenly remembered, oh yeah, I won him in a poker game last night. <laughs> so he turned little Jimmy into his co-pilot, even had him, uh, even had a, a, a suit of flying clothes made for him. And by God, if Jimmy didn't uh, accompany him on practically every mission. But there's a bet involved here too, which I know Tom wants to tell you about it. Well, uh, when Jean was in Paris, uh, enjoying the even wartime Paris, he was something to enjoy for him. He had three friends who were artists that he enjoyed getting together. Jean, it's funny, Jean, here's a guy from the rural South 
who gravitated toward creative people. And people, creative people gravitated towards him. We would find this out when we go a little bit further during the nightclub days where you'd have famous musicians and writers, uh, artists uh, gravitate towards him. He had these artist friends and he talked, he mentioned that he was going to be a combat pilot. And uh, two of the friends scoffed at him and they, among other reasons, they said, there's never been a pilot, you had the wrong color. There's never been a pilot of your color before, a combat pilot. But he also had a friend uh, who happened to be of, of independent means, and he basically put down a $2,000 bet. And he, and, and he said, I, I'm betting $2,000 uh, that, that Gene can do it. Somebody else will take that bet. So basically, Gene had a $2,000 incentive. And, and then, as we, as we know now from what we've talked about, he did become a combat pilot. And when he was on leave coming back to, to Paris, uh, he collected on that bet, and he and his three friends had a great time with that $2,000. He, he became a, a, a pilot serving with distinction, but unlike the men he served with, he's held back. Um, he leaves the United States thinking that he's going to perhaps escape racism, but he doesn't. And his bet noir uh, for years is a man named Dr. Edmund Gross. I believe we have a slide of him up now on the right there. Um, who was he? What was his problem? And how did he impact uh, Ballard's life? Well, Dr. Grow was uh, an American by birth and um, decided uh, uh, during his uh, <clears throat> pre-college years that he wanted to be a physician and uh, had some connections at uh, a medical college in Paris. And it wasn't unusual in those days for uh, Americans to go overseas to get various medical degrees, dental degrees, whatever. So uh, Dr. Gros goes, or Mr. Mr. Gros goes to Paris and goes to uh, medical school and graduates, becomes a doctor, and is involved with the American Hospital in Paris. In fact, he was one of the leading founders of the hospital. And early on in the war, um, he also was instrumental in uh, founding of the uh, famous uh, Afri uh, the uh, American Ambulance Corps, which Ernest Hemingway was part of, if you remember that story. And he also was approached by a couple of Americans who were then flying for France to see if he would use his connections, because Dr. Gros became very uh, connected to the um, French military and some higher ups in the French government, if he could use his influence to allow the Americans to start their own uh, squadron, their own flying unit, which uh, he worked uh, very hard to do and worked with some of the early American aviators um, in, in France. But unfortunately, the, ta the challenge with Dr. Grow is that he was a absolute, avowed, total, dyed-in-the-wool racist. I mean, he just not, did not believe in anything other than white superiority. And when he found out, which, he, of course, he would eventually that uh, Gene Ballard was training to become a pilot, even though flying for France. Uh, he set his eyes on Gene and tried very hard at every single opportunity he could get to get him drummed out of the Flying Corps. In fact, <clears throat> th th there were a group of rich Americans in France at the time who Dr. Gros convinced ought to uh, contribute to a fund that he could use to pay the Americans uh, who became pilots sort of an extra monetary incentive to fly uh, for France. And uh, of course, once Gene became a pilot and because he was an American, he was eligible to receive money from this fund. And Dr. Gro made sure that he always got his check last. He always got less than he should. He never quite caught him up on the amount of money that he was owed. And you'll see up on the screen also the uh, memorial dedication uh, of the Lafayette Flying Corps, the Americans who flew for France. They built a beautiful memorial in 1928, and Dr. Gros made sure that Jean did not get an invitation to the ceremony dedicating this monument, even though every other American 
who had flown for France did indeed. Did, didn't you have someone looking out for him there, though? I'm trying. Um, I did, didn't he, a, 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 colleague, a, a, a comrade alert him to the fact that was happening? Because I thought. Oh, yeah, there. yeah. No, I mean, the gene was, was extremely well liked by his peers and his, his fellow pilots, the Americans, the French, and they were always trying to, to look out for him and, and uh, try to shield him from, from this uh, racism, but the Americans didn't help either. When they finally got into it, as I mentioned uh, when we first started, uh, he volunteered immediately to become part of the American Air Service, and even though he passed the physical, uh, you couldn't join the service unless you were rated at least a second lieutenant. And of all the people who volunteered and out of all the people who were surveyed <clears throat> and examined medically, even though Gene passed the test despite his wounds with flying colors, he was rated a sergeant and therefore was not eligible to become an American pilot. He survives the war. And after World War I, he returns to Paris and begins the next phase of his remarkable life. Um, I think we have a slide about this. Jazz, by this time, has arrived in France in full force. How does Ballard move into this world? Well, <clears throat> when he was done with his service to France and came back to Paris, uh, obviously, somebody who was a combat pilot, that occupation was not in high demand. Uh, so he had to find a way to make a living, to find a job. Uh, he briefly resumed his boxing career, but that he understood that had a finite, you know, length to it. So he, uh, he taught himself how to, essentially taught himself how to play the drums. And he would get hired to play drums in these bands, as you, as you mentioned. Uh, what we call the Roaring Twenties in the United States was called the Crazy Years in, in Paris, where clubs were open for hours upon hours, the champagne flowed, people partied all day, or I should say partied all night, slept for part of the day. And uh, <clears throat> Gene, um, also because of he had this charisma, uh, and I, like I said, people were drawn to him. There's a, a, one of the most famous clubs in Paris at the time was called Zelly's. Z-E-L-L-I apostrophe S. And Gene was hired. He became the manager of, of Zelly's. And uh, um, there's, there's a, a short passage I just want to read while he was the manager there. By a remarkable coincidence, I have a copy of All Blood Runs Red right here. <laughs> I can't believe it. What are the odds? I know. I mean, and I think we have another image of um, sort of Gene's entrepreneurial, actually, and also a nice, a great shot of him as a boxer that we can put up, there we go. Yeah, and that also shows that one of his entrepreneurial efforts was to buy and operate his own gym. And the idea was that not only could people who were athletes train there, but if you stayed up all night at his club, you went to the gym and sweated it all out so you'd be healthy and rested enough so you could come back to his club the next night. He invented multiple streams of income. <laughs> he did, he's quite the multitasker. There you uh, go. When he was at Zelly's, uh, Bullard presided over a nightclub that was the place for the well-heeled and fashionable to congregate. Like Zelly's, he had the business designated as a bottle club, so it could stay open all night. Soon he was greeting and in some cases befriending a new wave of celebrities, all of whom wanted to enjoy the cozy and smoke-filled confines. <clears throat> Among these new habitués were Clifton Webb, the actor, dancer, and singer, who appeared in numerous movies and stage plays and was twice nominated for an Academy Award. The actress Tallulah Bankhead, who had yet to make it to transition from stage to screen star, and James Jimmy Walker, who in 1926 became mayor of New York City. Pablo Picasso was a regular too. Although already a world famous artist, he was nonetheless still struggling financially. Somehow his bills always got paid. His presence and cachet, as far as Bullard was concerned, far outweighed the cost of his champagne. Picasso was not the only famed artist who drank bubbly. Two other regulars were Man Ray, best known for his portrait photography, but also an avid painter, and Moisha Kisling, Bullard's old friend and compatriot from the Foreign Legion. Kisling was still living and painting during the day in a spacious loft not far from the club and spent many evenings in Bullard's company. Even though the money 
flowed into the nightclub as fast as the champagne flowed out of the ice cold bottles. The relationship between Bricktop, who is a uh, well-known uh, singer, uh, African-American singer he had brought over from America, and Bullard could be tense at times. Bricktop had been raised as a genteel sort under the guidance of a struggling yet doting mother. She was well-educated, and although not a college graduate, she had gone through high school with high marks in an integrated environment. Eugene Bullard, as we know, came to manhood in the company of gypsies, sailors, toughs, boxers, legionnaires, and utter war. He smoked, he drank, he cursed, and he had a hair-trigger temper, especially when it came to matters of race and racial prejudice. Hardly a week went by without some sort of confrontation in a bar fight that often spilled out into the streets. Now, Gene, you know, one of the reasons we, we included this, other than wanting to be as accurate as possible, was no angel. Uh, he was a tough customer. He, he, if people were misbehaving in his club, he could use a left or a right or both fists to, to, to be a peacemaker, so to speak. Uh, he did like to drink. He did smoke. Um, he was he was a he was a legend, a, a, a character that um, I think would have been easy for a novelist to create because he was so charismatic and so many aspects to his personality. The closest he came to that, in fact, is and when Ernest Hemingway became one of his friends and a frequenter of the nightclub, is if a, next time somebody reads The Sun Also Rises, there is a character based on a, a black jazz drummer in, in the band at one of these nightclubs that base, is based on Gene Bullard. And, and Glenn, if, if you could go back to that <clears throat> previous slide, the montage. Um, of, of the five the, musicians, the jazz yeah, musicians. Uh, the one before this, yeah. Uh, just to just to show you what was what was going on up upper upper left, uh, that is Gene um, at, at a club in Paris, and when he came to <clears throat> have his own uh, club, which was called the L'Escadrille, which of course is the squadron <clears throat> in in English, he he hired a young dishwasher, who is the uh, portrait next to him, and that's Langston Hughes. Langston Hughes was a dishwasher in, in, in Gene's nightclub. <laughs> uh, Bricktop is in the lower left, <clears throat> and uh, Louis Armstrong is in the lower right, and Louis spent a great deal of, uh, of time uh, in, in Gene's club. The piano player is an interesting story. Uh, his name, the piano player you see in this picture, is Dooley Wilson. Now, if that name doesn't leap to the fore of your brain, uh, this is Sam from Play It Again, Sam in the famous movie Casablanca. And Dooley was the piano player in uh, Gene's, uh, in Gene's nightclub. <clears throat> Let's not forget Josephine Baker there. Oh, and Josephine, yeah. Let's not Josephine forget Baker. Josephine Baker. Yeah. Yeah. In the, in the uh, so it's between the wars and Bullard has become an entrepreneur and, and he seems to be living a, a kind of wonderful life exactly where he wanted to be. But in the thirties, reality and the looming threat of Nazi Germany intrudes. Bullard saw this coming, correct? He never uh, gained any kind of affection for the Germans. Uh, you know, even very early on, he would, he would tell everybody who would listen to him that, there will be another war. He didn't think that the, that the Germans were done in their ideas of, of dominating their, their neighboring countries. So um, when he had his, uh, Phil referred to the club Leska Drill, uh, it was a very, even in the 30s, when it wasn't quite as crazy years as the 1920s, it was still a very popular nightclub. And, and uh, the, as, as more and more Germans were visiting Paris, some of them were just out and out spies. Some of them were upfront military officers who were trying to gain information and they would party. And, and uh, Gene actually welcomed them to his club because he was had by this time formed a, uh, an alliance, let's say with the French resistance or what eventually became the French resistance, the Duxem Bureau, which was their uh, police force that was trying to find spies in there. And, um, uh, with, uh, with the help of also a woman who worked at the club, uh, a beautiful woman named Cleopatra, um, who became sort of like, he's the Black Bogart, she was the, the Ilsa uh, uh, figure <laughs> in Casablanca. Um, they, uh, 
uh, he would, he would more, the more mili German military, the better, because they felt that they could talk in an unguarded way when Gene was around. He would be nice to them. He would tell them jokes. He would pour them champagne. He would have these, he would have stilted conversations with them, you know, in his, in his supposedly, let's say, poor French. First of all, the Germans looked at a black man as subhuman anyway. And then to have this obsequious servant manager uh, 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 kissing up to them, they would just go ahead and talk about military secrets. They would talk about things like the impending invasion of Poland, never comprehending or believing the possibility that he spoke Italian, German, French, in addition to English. So they're chatting away in German, and he's storing up every little bit of information he can and passing them along to the, the, the French espionage people. So he, he becomes a spy as part of the organization that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, there's a, I, I, I know we didn't, I may be springing this on you guys, but there's a wonderful and harrowing scene in the book involving a soccer ball. Does, it's on pages 239 and 240. Do one of you want to do a spontaneous reading of that? It's about a page. And it really shows that he wasn't just listening. He wasn't just sitting in his club, picking up information. He was an active part of a resistance. Maybe not the resistance, but a resistance. Got on the streets, yes. I think we're about to hear Phil's dulcet tones. <laughs> well, I uh, remember that story uh, quite quite well. Um, Bullard had a couple of very narrow escapes. One day he was given several rolls of film hidden inside a soccer ball that he was to take to a British Army colonel, soon to be a guest at Mrs. James Chateau. And at the time, uh, Bullard was working for Mrs. James. <clears throat> as soon as he left the office building in Montmartre, where the resistance cell met, soccer ball under his arm, he noticed a tail of two suspicious looking Aryan men following him. His heart skipped a beat. If the men stopped him, they would surely examine the soccer ball and then it would be all over for Ballard. Rounding a corner ahead of the men, he ran into a group of six boys playing soccer in an empty lot. Thinking quickly, he traded soccer balls with the boys and told them to meet him three blocks away in 10 minutes, and if they did, he'd give them 20 francs. The ruse worked. Ballard took the new soccer ball and continued walking just as the Germans turned the corner. He then started jogging, which caused the men to speed up too. Another block away, he pretended to panic and tossed the ball down an alleyway. The Germans took off after the ball. Ballard found the boys, gave them their reward, enough for three new soccer balls and lunch, and trotted off to meet his contact. That's great. He, he, he is still an American, and he has the option as the Germans approach to leave France before the Nazis invade. He chooses not to. Uh, despite his age and his injuries, he decides to fight. Why and what happens to him because of that decision? I believe we have another slide about uh, to, sh to show there. He, he, it, it, it seems in hindsight on, its, on, on the surface to be kind of a, an insane decision for a man of his age. Why did he make it? it it's also a difficult decision, too, because we, we don't have time necessarily to talk too much more about his personal life. But he had two daughters. Yeah, I was going to bring that up. Yeah. He was a single parent by this point. And he was raising his two daughters, so uh, to, to put himself in jeopardy also meant putting his daughters' jeopardy and their future in jeopardy. But again, he felt compelled to fight for France, and he let's face it, he hated the Nazis. He hated, you know, he didn't like the Germans from the First World War. He hated the Nazis ten times worse. And uh, so he joined the French infantry, which was reeling at the time from, you know, loss after loss at the hand of the German blitz Blitzkrieg. <clears throat> so. Uh, in another battle uh, against the Germans, he is, he is again severely wounded. And the idea that he, he's 44 years old, uh, he's really of no good anymore, wounded. And he's also being hunted by the Nazis because it's, you know, the word has gotten out that he was a spy for the, for the, for the French resistance. So um, he has to make his way uh, across the rest of France and into Spain and then eventually 
to Lisbon where he could catch a ship that would take him to safety back to the United States. And it's a very harrowing journey because he's, he's, he's hurt. Uh, he, it's, you can't flag a bus, you know, he's got to he use a bicycle to make part of this trip. Uh, there are all kinds of refugees. Food is scarce. Uh, you never know who you could trust. Uh, he even gets to one part where they're going to give him a, a passport or exit visa, but he needs to get something signed by a place he just spent hours and hours bicycling from. He's got to bicycle back and get the, this paper signed and then go back again. And even at that point, he's, he's, gonna, he's being challenged when he's crossing the border into, into Spain and eventually uh, we'll get into Portugal. Um, so he always, it's the resilience and again, the luck to a certain extent. He meets somebody who's a crossing guard who he once knew in his boxing days who helps him sneak out of the country into the next country. Wasn't he also wounded again? He was thrown 40 feet into a building, wasn't he? Yes, <clears throat> severely wounded. And thankfully, his back was badly injured. So every step, every bicycle pump that he took was agony. But again, this is somebody who, in spite of whatever the challenge is, does not give up. He, he escapes and makes his way back to the States. And I think you, you mentioned he utilizes and spends some of that Ballard luck to get there. Um, how does he get there? What does he find when he arrives? And how long is it before he's able to have a reunion with his daughters in the States? Well, he had left his uh, daughters in the care of his uh, companion from the resistance. And uh, she swore that she would take care of them, hide them if necessary, keep them away from the Gestapo. <clears throat> and she was true to her word, long story short. But uh, Jean lands back in, in, in New York, and there's a very nice uh, scene in the book about uh, him, uh, as have many, many, many others, passing the Statue of Liberty for the first time. <clears throat> and he uh, gets off the ship, and uh, he had secreted 100,000 French francs in his beret. But by the time he gets to New York, the 100,000 French francs are worth like a nickel because the currency has collapsed, France is done. And so he's penniless. He gets a loan from the American Legion for $25 and a place to stay for a few days until he can establish himself. <clears throat> Which in his unique way, he continues to do. He's very fortunate in that he exercises his connections, including going to see the former ambassador of the United States to France, who was a friend of his in France, who is now back in the States. <clears throat> and that gentleman is instrumental in getting the papers put together to get Jean's daughters out of France, sneak them aboard another ship, and he finally gets them back, oh, <clears throat> about a year after he lands in New York. But, you know, by this time, he's a pretty beaten up guy. And uh, he's been through two world wars, um, you know, even though he has numerous decorations and honors to his credit, he's a stranger in his homeland. He, he becomes, after, after some time, he becomes what I would refer to as almost an accidental civil rights martyr. Um, and, and another encounter with someone who, at least to the general public, have more renown, he goes to see the legendary activist and singer Paul Robeson up in Peekskill. And there was a, an infamous, infamous uh, race riot that happened outside of uh, of his of his um, concert in Peekskill. How did Eugene walk into yet another remarkable moment in history? I, this was certainly finding out about this. One of the things, not that I needed it, but convinced me that that Phil and I were writing about one of the most amazing lives of the 20th century, because we had so much happened to him or he participated in so much up to this point 
that one would think that once he is reunited with his daughters in New York and working a job and they're living in, a, in East Harlem and, and, and he can very quietly live out the rest of his life. But um, what happened was Paul Robeson was having a, doing a concert in Peekskill and a large number of people were being bussed up from New York City to see this concert, one of whom was Gene Ballard. And uh, when the buses started emptying of people to go into the arena, uh, there were, uh, you could see obviously these were not just vigilantes, but police officers, state police, local police, that's Gene Ballard being beaten right there. And that's because he, would, he, he was a un, inadvertent in a way leader. He wasn't gonna stay on the bus. He wasn't gonna not go to the, so he was actually beaten and beaten to the ground. I don't know if we have it, but there's another slide that actually shows him on the ground being kicked and beaten. And he was severely beaten and injured. And yet when they stopped beating him and backed off, he managed to drag himself to his feet and stagger. He was not gonna be denied, stagger into that arena and everybody followed him in there and the concert was held. And if I can just interject quickly here, what does this slide remind you of from recent history? Yeah. Right? John, shows. John Lewis. What was happening? Remember John Lewis? Yeah. At the Edmund Pettus Bridge? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he, he survives this as well. Um, and despite returning to America, he remains inextricably tied to France. Um, what were those connections? And I think he makes a return to France and finds that not all those connections remain pleasant. He, he goes back to see where, what his properties, what happened to them. So what were his connections as he was staying in America? How did he nurture them? And then what happened when he went back to France? Well, he had a very uh, excellent support network of ex French, uh, you know, um, expats who were living in, in New York. And he involved himself in a couple of, you know, French uh, resistance and freedom groups during uh, the second, the remainder of the Second World War. And he had a lot of buddies from the old Lafayette Escadrille that he hung out with. <clears throat> but uh, he decided in, in, in 1950 to go back to Paris to see what had happened, as you said, Glenn, to, to his properties. And unfortunately, he had to board up and leave everything so quickly uh, to get out of the Nazi takeover of Paris that he secured no deeds, no rights, no papers to any of what he had previously owned. And during the years that he was gone, um, other people had moved into those properties essentially as squatters and, and had uh, taken them up and uh, Gene unfortunately didn't have a leg to stand on <clears throat> to get his uh, properties back. He did get a small pension from the French government for his service in, in not only one war but two and uh, that was uh, of, of some significance to him. In fact, he got a small financial settlement, but it was enough to sort of buy into his uh, apartment in Spanish Harlem in New York and make life a little easier for him. And uh, Glenn, to anticipate something I think you're going to ask about, you know, Phil mentioned that, that uh, he got a small pension. Um, Gene was not financially stable by any means, and he eventually took a job as an elevator operator at Rockefeller Center. Uh, his remaining years, that's how he, <clears throat> in those days, pe human beings actually ele operated elevators. <clears throat> and and uh, in that building was the offices of the NBC studios, which at the time, uh, uh, the, the Today Show with Dave Garraway. And uh, Gene uh, would show up every day for work with his elevator operator uniform. But also each day he would pick a different, he, I think he was awarded something like 15 medals for all his service, uh, military service. And he liked to adorn his uniform with a medal each day. And, uh, and one day, this was, this would turn out to be Gene's 15 minutes of fame. One day, Dave Garraway, the host of the Today Show at that time, who probably barely took notice of Gene to begin with, noticed Gene and 
that he had a medal on. And he said, what's that medal? And Gene explained it to him, well, I won this, you know, whichever that medal was about. And Gar Garraway was flabbergasted. Who is this elevator operator? That's a hero of France. And he asked him to come up to his office and Gene told him his life story. And Gar Garraway was gobsmacked. And eventually, uh, I believe it was in December, I'm gonna say 59, I think 59 or 60, uh, Gene uh, Bullard was a, a guest of the Dave Garraway on the Today Show with his medals on display. And I, think we have an, I think we have an image of both the, the, the show and the, and the medals. Yeah, let's go. So, yeah, there, there's, so there we go. He's on the, on the Today Show uh, with, in his elevator operator uniform with a display of all the medals he had won. I mean, Garraway stumbled upon one of his most intriguing stories that he ever presented on the Today Show by taking notice of this, this, this uh, the elevator operator who turned out to be Gene Bullard. Somebody uh, asked in the in the Q and A um, uh, that were, were at some point his medals stolen from the U.S. Air Force Museum and were they recovered? So, then Michael, thank you for that question. So, the, the, do you, do you guys know anything about that? That his medals may have been stolen? Uh, we do know that they are currently on display. Okay. So they they must have been that would be that would be a great addition to the story. I'd love to know that. <laughs> um, there was another. Sorry, go ahead, Tom. I was going to say for the paperback edition. There you go. Uh, addendum. Epi epilogue. Epilogue. Yeah. Um, also, it, it wasn't just. I think Garraway was his visual claim to fame, but another famous person uh, came across his story and thought it notable. A former first lady. Eleanor Roosevelt. Yeah, she. <clears throat> wrote a column, I think for, um, what was it, Tom, was it the Post, not the Post, but the, oh, the Daily News yeah. for many, many years. <clears throat> and she uh, actually picked up Gene's story uh, about the time that he was going on the Today Show. He had also just been awarded France's highest decoration, the Legion of Honor by the French consul in New York. And that had come about because of a petition back in uh, France. And uh, <clears throat> Mrs. Roosevelt wrote a very touching story about how Jean got the, uh, uh, the award. And that gave him another 15 minutes of fame. So now he's up to 30, but he deserves a bit more. So someone asks about talking about fame in general um, someone asked, is there a movie in the works? <laughs> you know, we hope so. Uh, <laughs> we, when, when the book was published in the months subsequent to the book being published, there was actually quite a bit of interest. And uh, at the forefront um, uh, of, of that interest was a producer and actress named Lena Waite, African-American producer and actress, mm -hmm. uh, she's known for the chai, uh, she's known for, you know, writing shows, or doing, wrote a, wrote a movie that came out last year. And so her company is now, has the rights to the story. Uh, we're, we're waiting to find out who she's going to work in collaboration with. And of course, everything is slowed down because of the pandemic. I, I think, I think this is the kind of thing that would have been a slam dunk and we wouldn't even be talking about ongoing negotiations if you know back in March if it hadn't been for the pandemic but it's still going on uh, I think obvious I, I think it's very obvious that uh, we hope this attempt works but in any case in the climate that we have now and in Hollywood over the past at least the past six to eight months who has gotten a little more shall I say woke sounds strange coming out of my mouth but but uh, about uh, trying to do more African-American stories and uh, with African American uh, protagonists, uh, it, it'd be hard to find something that has so many layers and so much drama, and such an amazing central character than than Gene Bullitt and All Blood Runs Red. I think that 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 speaks to the fact that that your efforts to unearth the story and bring it to light today just show that there are thousands of stories in American history that just haven't been told like yes. this. Bullard tried to tell this story during his lifetime. He wrote a memoir. What was that memoir like, and why was it not published during his life? 
Well, <clears throat> we actually we actually took the title "All Blood Runs Red" from his um, unpublished autobiography. That's what he called his own story, <clears throat> and uh, he got that idea. You showed uh, a bit ago a, a slide of him sitting in his airplane. He painted a red heart on each side of his airplane and he had a dagger piercing the red heart and the motto in French translated to English is all blood runs red which was his way of saying you know I'm an African-American I'm a pilot but we're all in this together we're all fighting the war together and when we bleed all of us bleed the same we all bleed red <clears throat> At the very end of his life, hoping that he could sell uh, a book uh, to help support his daughters, he sat down and wrote out his story. And he wrote it out longhand on yellow pads in French. But there was a very nice woman that he knew who was uh, in the magazine business uh, in, this is the 1960 time frame. Who, who was kind enough to take his manuscript, clean it up, and type it up in English. And she was well-connected in the publishing business in New York. She took it around to several of the most famous editors and publishers of the day. And they were all fascinated by the story, totally intrigued. But the bottom line was, who's going to believe this? Yeah. <laughs> and on that basis alone, plus the fact, and, I mean, you're talking like 1959, 1960, when relations between France and America really soured with de Gaulle and Eisenhower and Khrushchev and the whole business. Nobody really wanted to publish a book about essentially a French hero. So I think, you know, those factors much delayed uh, the story, and uh, we're trying to make up for that now. Right. It's it's an amazing story, and we can put up that last great photo of Eugene. Um, I, I first of all, it's a, 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 tell us tell us what this what we're looking at. Number one, this is a bronze bust of Gene in obviously his aviator's outfit, and it's at the National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's part of a very small exhibit uh, honoring Gene, <clears throat> a much larger, more extensive exhibit exists at the Air Force Museum uh, in Ohio. But this is a nice start. And, and we hope that uh, maybe even <clears throat> the National uh, African American Museum Mm -hmm. at some point soon may pick up his story because it would be great, we think, um, for uh, modeling uh, past uh, heroes who are African-American. So first I want to, everyone who's viewing, thank you so much for spending time with us. That's first of all. Please remember um, the two copies of the book per person. So if you're watching with someone, that's that's four. Um, we'll get you'll get contacted by books on call if you uh, are interested in getting a book plate. It's going to be a little time consuming to get the book plates to the authors. There are two of them, and then back, and then to you. But please be patient. But most of all, I want to thank Phil and Tom for this remarkable book, and for taking the time to be with us here today. So, good gentlemen, thank you so much. Thank you. Our pleasure. Uh, I wish you the best and look forward to doing something like this in person sometime in the future. Wouldn't that be great? Yes, it would. And uh, Nadine, thank you very much. National Arts Club, thank you very much. And I want to wish everybody a very, very good night. So good night, everybody. Good night. Take care. Thanks, all.